Great, I think we're live. Welcome to my living room. Uh, let's get started. Um, this is the first lecture on Moby Dick, uh, and we're gonna start with Herman Melville's biography today. But first, to summarize the main point of our last session, thinking about the article by uh, Jeffrey Sanborn, don't set out to learn anything from Moby Dick. You're not being asked to get something profound from this book. You're only here to listen and to think alongside this voice in the novel speaking to you. If it helps, pretend like you found this book on a desert island. How would you read it? What would you treasure in it if you didn't know it was like a classic that you had to read for school? Just approach it like that. All right, in this lecture, I want to offer you a brief biographical sketch of Herman Melville, which will remind us as we're thinking about Moby Dick uh, to keep Melville, the author, separate from his famous narrator, Ishmael. This is always one of the first things we want to do with a work of art, to distinguish between the author and the narrator, the main speaking voice. They're not the same. I want to suggest that Ishmael represents a piece of Melville's inner life that has somehow become untethered, unglued, unmoored from the rest of, of Western thought and civilization, perhaps as a result of Melville's experience as a New Englander and New Yorker who became a sailor and who saw a great deal in his travels that didn't quite square with what he was raised to think and believe about the world. Now, this is kind of the case for all of us, right? We're raised with certain truths at home and then we discover other truths abroad in the world, and both are true, and we have to integrate them somehow into a coherent life. This is what Melville's struggling to do in Moby Dick. And in Ishmael, the narrator, could perhaps be thought of as like the remainder, um, what gets left out, the unintegrated part of Melville's psyche that has been made intellectually restless, maybe even homeless by his travels, and has, has come home newly determined to drink life to the lees and see what's really at the bottom of the cup. It's these attempts to bring together the truths he learns among like the Presbyterians in New York and the truths he learns from the, the naked cannibalistic islanders of Tahiti. That's what makes Moby Dick such a strange and free floating adventure encompassing so much of human experience. So we'll talk about Melville himself today. Grab a pencil, take some notes. Um, I should tell you my main source is going to be this, um, Andrew Delbenko. He teaches at Columbia. It's his excellent biography called Melville, His World and His Work. Um, there's another great biography out there, probably a better biography, by a guy named Herschel Parker, who lives in Morro Bay, of all places. Um, I was going to try to get him to come in and talk to you guys, but uh, not right now. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, here are some features that, that Melville shares in common with his narrator, Ishmael. Namely, the most important one, I, I think, is that, that they're both wanderers, okay? If you remember the story from the book of Genesis in the Tanakh, the, Tanakh, the, the Hebrew Bible, um, the Old Testament, God chooses a man named Abraham. I think actually at this point his name is still Abram. And, and he tells Abram that he will be the father of nations. He makes a covenant. Now, the only problem is that Abram and his wife, Sarai, are on the older side of things. She's past childbearing years. She can't conceive. But God has made this promise. So they're trying to figure out how to make this work. And, and Sarai offers her handmaiden, a woman named Hagar, to her husband, Abram. And Abram and Hagar have a child named Ishmael. So Ishmael is the firstborn of Abram, but then he's going to become Abraham, which is kind of confusing. But Ishmael is also, in some sense, we have to remember, a bastard. He's not the legitimate son of Abraham and Sarah, Abram and Sarai. Shortly thereafter, Sarai, who then becomes Sarah, it gets confusing, lots of names, Abraham's wife conceives a son, and it's a miracle. This son is named Isaac, and he is the son through whom the blessing will descend. The God of Israel is known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It goes on through the line. 
right? That's the chosen line of descent. So here's the question. What happens to Ishmael? You're going to have to read the rest of Genesis to find out. But the short answer is that he becomes a wanderer. And a new line of nations is going to be established through him. These nations, to make a very complicated story very short, are the Arabic nations, the nations of Islam. Ishmael becomes the forefather of the prophet Muhammad. That's pretty exciting, right? Uh, but if you're living in 19th century America, being the forerunner of Muhammad is maybe not as cool as being the forerunner of Jesus. So Ishmael is, from Melville's inherited perspective of like kind of a more Eurocentric form of Christianity, an outcast and a wanderer. And so Melville writes that first sentence, call me Ishmael. It's a warning to the reader. It's a shot across the bow. This is not going to be a cozy, fun, safe story about God's chosen blessed people. This is going to be told from the perspective of the outsider, the wanderer, the one to whom uh, God's blessing has been denied. So that's Ishmael. What about Herman Melville? What was his life like? Melville was born in 1819 in New York, and he lived on Broadway in like an up-and-coming family. He claimed what he called double revolutionary descent, which means that his patrilineal grandfather on his father's side um, was part of the Boston Tea Party. And his, his matrilineal grandmother was a revolutionary war hero. Um, they, people referred to him as like the hero of Fort Stanwix. Um, and he, actually Melville was so proud of this, he named his second son Stanwix. That's a good name, Stanwix. Maybe I'll steal that. Um, and so uh, Melville was very proud of, of the, the sort of Americanness of his heritage. Um, he also had, um, from his parental influence, both strains, uh, religious strains of, of Unitarianism, um, a more sort of liberal, generous, God is sweetness and light kind of Christianity, like think Ralph Waldo Emerson. And, and then on, and that was on one side. And then on his mother's side, he had uh, the Dutch Reformed side. Um, and that's more of like, like uh, the God of, of wrath, um, the, the, the God of Calvin, uh, the Old Testament God a little bit more. Um, so he had kind of both of these strains um, in him as he was growing up in New York. He went to a prep school, a private school. He was very bright and verbally gifted, but he wouldn't study. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to comment on that. That one hits a little too close to home for me. <laughs> bright, but wasted his schooling a little bit. Um, so uh, the Melvilles um, uh, had this, this prodigy um, in their family until debt caught up to them. Tuition was too much. And even though they wanted to sort of like cultivate artistic and aristocratic sensibilities in their children, they were never far from poverty. Herman's father died when he was 12 from overwork. And so he was sent to work in a bank at 13. Some of you are like, I would like to <laughs> drop out of school and go work in a bank and make money. But it wasn't that great for Melville. Um, I'll read you this passage. This is, uh, um, I've got it here. This is uh, from one of his uh, later novels called Redburn. And the narrator says, quote, uh, I had learned to think much and bitterly before my time. I must not think of those delightful days before my father became a bankrupt and we moved from the city. For when I think of those days, something rises up in my throat and almost strangles me. So not a happy time for the Melvilles, his teenage years. Eventually, uh, Melville did what a lot of people do when they're looking for work. At first, he taught school. Uh, this was not a good fit for him. He event ended up going west for a while. He got as far west as Illinois looking for work, uh, but nothing really seemed to, to go his way. And so skipping ahead, at 22, 22 years old in 1842, Melville sets sail aboard a whaling ship, the Akushnet. Whaling. You got to think of it like this. Whale oil was as ubiquitous as petroleum or, or plastic, right? Everything is made out of plastic. 
um, our cars all run on gas, right? This, this is this is how uh, um, omnipresent whale oil was in their society. So there are lots of whaling ships out there, and those whaling ships needed crews of brave and possibly, you know, <laughs> stupid young men uh, who wanted to um, see the world, have an adventure, and make some money and be a part of something. So that's Melville at 22. Now, they're sailing around in the South Pacific Islands. And uh, this whaling ship was not a very uh, um, well-run operation. And Melville, with his friend Richard Tobias Green, deserts. They leave the ship south of Hawaii, somewhere in like Polynesia. And they live on these islands with the Taipei natives. And this is sort of going to become the basis of Melville's first novel. He writes a novel uh, called Taipei um, with a, a woman, a character, uh, an islander named Fayaway. And he says about her, this is great, I love this. He says she, quote, wore the garb of Eden, right? This is the kind of thing that made Melville a, a literary sensation slash scandal because we all know what they wore in Eden, right? It wasn't much. And Melville describes the Islanders in this like kind of patronizing tradition of, of, of Rousseau um, as, as like noble savages. There isn't a great deal of cultural sensitivity or even like any real tools or playbook for cross-cultural encounter at the time. So some of Melville's thinking about native peoples may strike us rightly as problematic, but the point is to see how potentially disorienting this was for a boy raised in New York in these like Dutch reformed churches. And he's here on the islands meeting whole societies who don't have this view of a fallen man who've never heard of such a thing as original sin. And yet they're also, you know, maybe eating each other in certain ritual situations. I should, I should note that, that while Melville certainly was under the impression that the islanders he encountered were cannibals. Um, some anthropologists have reasons to doubt that assumption. But he here's the point. This experience of, of the boy from New England who ends up in, in Tahiti, how does this confirm the Puritan idea of original sin for Melville? Or does it do the opposite? Does it refute that idea of original sin? Do we live in paradise? Or did we lose it somewhere along the way with Adam and Eve and the fall? These are the kinds of struggles that Melville is working through in Moby Dick. Now, Melville hitchhiked to Tahiti and Hawaii aboard an Australian whaler. Eventually, um, it was not a very well-run ship again, and uh, he mutinies with a bunch of other crew members. They're imprisoned, uh, but fortunately the prison they were put in wasn't any better run than the ship they were put in, and so he escapes. And okay, by 1844, late 1844, he's back in Boston by way of a U.S. frigate. Now, imagine returning from two years away from civilization. What would look different to you? Melville comes back as a sort of outsider, but one who knows the intellectual code, the DNA of Western civilization. And so he starts writing. He writes these novels, Taipei and Umu. Those are the first two novels that he writes. And they're bestsellers overnight in the, the sort of uh, travel genre, um, especially when uh, this guy, Robert Tobias Green, who jumped ship with Melville, he reappears, he resurfaces, and he confirms the facts of the story, right? When these novels come out, everyone's like, oh, this is sensational, Melville is making this up, and then here comes this guy saying, no, I was there. Um, and so he becomes a, a literary celebrity overnight, Melville does. Um, he gets married in 1847, and he doesn't even get married in a church because the fans would have crowded the pews, right? That's how popular he is at the time doesn't last. The next couple novels don't do as well. Redburn and White Jacket are what they're called. Um, and then finally he writes this weird novel called Mardi. Um, it's a massive disappointment. Uh, everyone says it's too philosophical, it's rambling, Melville's run out of material. 
And now 1850, this brings us to 1850. This is the key year. Moby Dick is published in 1851, but 1850 is when he's writing it. In 1850, Melville moves uh, moves uh, out to the Berkshires, to the, to the mountains in Western Massachusetts, to a farm he calls Arrowhead. Um, and it's in this little place called Pittsfield. And um, you could drive right past it and not even know uh, that there's anything there. Um, and while he's at Pittsfield, he meets a man named Nathaniel Hawthorne. And Hawthorne gets sent, sorry, my wife is making fun of me from the other room. No, I'm just cheering for Hawthorne. Oh, she's cheering for Hawthorne, all right. Cool, Dr. Marini cheering for Hawthorne. All right, so there is a, uh, a meeting, this famous meeting between Hawthorne and Melville. Um, Hawthorne at the time is a serious writer and an artist, and he's well uh, respected and, and regarded in even overseas a little bit in Europe. And Melville's like this hack who's writing these trashy fiction novels. And the two of them get together on a picnic and the picnic gets it turns into a hike and they're, they're walking up in the mountains and all of a sudden a thunderstorm strikes and, and Melville and Hawthorne are forced to shelter together on this hike, like under a rock or something for a couple of hours. Nobody really knows what was said during this brief time in the thunderstorm, but whatever it was, it changed Melville forever. If only I had like a tape recorder and could go back and like record this conversation. Meeting Hawthorne, I'm trying to say, was this decisive event in, in Melville's life where, where he decided that um, he was going to become really a serious artist. And Hawthorne inspired him. Hawthorne um, maybe even enamored him. Um, and Melville decides that um, that literature um, has something to say about the human condition. It's not just a way of making money. It's not just a way of, you know, telling stories um, around the fire, which we all need stories told around the fire. But there's more going on here. Hawthorne is the key. Now, a lot of critics think that there are sort of two Moby Dicks, really. That you know, the first one when Melville's writing it, the first drafts of it don't really contain Ahab. They don't even really contain the whale Moby Dick. They're about some other guy, Bulkington, right? There's there's this whole like other kind of plot in it. But Melville rewrites these chapters after meeting Hawthorne. And then the book really gets going. The book really takes to see. Melville also writes um, a, a little uh, um, review of one of Hawthorne's books. It's called Hawthorne and His Mosses. And he says this in the review. He says, this is a quote. Melville says, quote, better to fail in originality than to succeed in imitation. Better to fail in originality than to succeed in imitation. You can hear there the syntax is echoing Paradise Lost, where Satan says, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Moby Dick takes on a life of its own after Melville meets Hawthorne. And he says, I'm going to try to do something great and, and I might fail, but it's better than to, to just be a hack and succeed in imitation for the rest of my life. One other thing happens in 1850 that's very important, something called the Fugitive Slave Act. The Fugitive Slave Act meant that escaped slaves from southern states who had fled north could be rounded up as property and returned to their owners in the south. This is part of what fuels the Underground Railroad um, as slaves are trying to escape, not just into, into the north, but all the way up into Canada where they can be free. Melville's father-in-law was a man named Lemuel Shaw, and he was a judge in charge of enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. And Melville thought this is the most opprobrious thing ever. There's a line in Moby Dick um, where he says, I'm quoting Moby Dick here, Melville says, delight is to him who gives no quarter in the truth and kills, burns, and destroys all sin, though he pluck it out from under the robes of senators and judges. Delight, top gallant delight is to him who acknowledges no law or Lord, but the Lord his God, and is only a patriot to heaven. 
Melville felt that the Fugitive Slave Act was making him choose between his country and his conscience, between the law of the land and the law of God. The law of the land is to return these slaves to their owners. The law of God is to be free. Melville feels like he has to make a choice. And more so, his father-in-law is the one who is enforcing that choice. You can see all this pressure that's coming to bear on Moby Dick. In fact, there's a there's a famous um, literary uh, there's a famous uh, author, a Nobel Prize winning author named Toni Morrison. I have her book here. Um, oh, there she is on the back of the book. Um, she has a book of essays. Uh, she died last year, um, but this was her last book of essays called "The Sources of Self Regard." And she, in this book of essays, posits Moby Dick as one of the great anti-racist, anti-slavery novels of the 19th century. But it wasn't understood as such at the time. Melville dove so deep into these issues uh, that it, it just took years and years for people to understand what, what was really going on, what he was really talking about. Um, but it's there. Um, the, 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 the sin, original sin of slavery is, is, burns behind every page of Moby Dick. All right, so that's the year 1850 with the Fugitive Slave Act, with the meeting of Nathaniel Hawthorne. We're going to kind of cut the bio short here um, because this is when Moby Dick is published. I'll just give you a little glimpse at Melville's last years. They're full of failure, uh, withdrawal, resignation. Um, the Civil War comes. We won't talk too much about this we'll, uh, yet. We're going to talk about it after we, we read Moby Dick. That Melville died in a kind of uneasy peace, a kind of obscurity. Upon the publication of his obituary, um, several of his writer friends were surprised to discover that he was even still alive. The, one of the obituaries, I think, even misspelled his name uh, in it. I mean, he, he was completely faded from the public eye, even though he'd written um, um, Moby Dick, right? He says at one point uh, in a letter, he says, um, though I wrote the Gospels in this century, I'll die in the gutter. Now, why does, do we still read Moby Dick? Well, in part, we read it because of the 1920s. The 1920s is a time of modernist revival when people are getting ready to read challenging, interesting books again, books that suggest that reality is bigger than we understand. Some of this is, is, is coming, you know, from, from uh, advances in modern physics where we're starting to understand the expanding universe, the quantum dimensions of reality, and, and we're ready for, for Moby Dick, which is telling us, you know, trying to get us to see this bigger, deeper picture. Um, you know, psychologically, uh, in the 1920s are, 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 are when psychology gets going, with, at least with, with Freud and, and the Vienna School, and, and there's a sense of uh, that, that the self that, that consciousness is bigger than we would have imagined. And Melville knew it all just years too early <laughs> for the rest of us. Um, Melville knew that we can't approach these things directly. We have to approach some of the deepest realities indirectly. In fact, there's a chapter in Moby Dick um, where he talks about uh, rainbows and he says, look, light needs some medium to shine through in order to be seen. We see it as color, but we can only see it through, through a medium, right? Through water. When light shines through water, that's what makes a rainbow. And we can only see reality in a sense as it shines through our senses, through our language, through our concepts. This is a central problem, right? We, we all want to figure out the world, and yet the only thing that we have to access the world is the way it's filtered through our perception, our, through our senses, through our language, just as light becomes color only when it passes through the medium of water to make a rainbow. The filter, the thing that makes light visible also distorts it. And it's the same with us, right? Our language, our concepts with which we filter the world and make it knowable also distort it in the process. Language is only ever an approximation of the truth inside us and around us and yet it's all we have. So this so-called linguistic turn in philosophy that I've just been describing is, is like a central tenet of modernism, which modernism, which we're going to study more of next year. But, but the point is just to see that Moby Dick 
is already anticipating this. It's ahead of its time in anticipating the difficulties of bringing together words and the world. And, and so that's sort of some of what accounts for the literary weirdness of Moby Dick uh, that 19th century audiences just weren't ready to understand. It's a weirdness uh, in a way where like the truth is weirder than the facts. Um, uh, the truth is a lot more slippery than the facts. Um, and so is Moby Dick. Moby Dick is a slippery fish. All right, hopefully some of that background on Melville is helpful. My wife is giving me things to read. Oh, okay, she's giving me a passage. I'll just read this. Thus inevitably, and people are knocking on our door. This is fun. Uh, Thus inevitably does the universe wear our color. Ooh, she's good. And every object falls successively into the subject itself. Ah, that's nice. Oh, this is Emerson. This is not Melville. This is from Emerson. Thus inevitably does the universe wear our color, and every object falls successively into the subject itself. I knew I married her for some reason. Um, all right. Uh, hopefully that background on Melville is helpful. Um, I'll record another lecture here in a few minutes, and we will actually open up the book. Um, thanks for listening. Enjoy your afternoon or evening or whenever you're watching this. All right.